In this video, we're going to talk about something called the curl of a vector field. So, in a calculus class, it makes sense that if we're studying rates of change, what does rate of change mean for a vector field? This is not an easy question to answer. Recall that a vector could change in two different ways. It could change its direction, or it could change its magnitude. So what we mean by rate of change, or how we would measure how a vector field is changing, is really driven by the physics behind the vector field. And so two measures that we're going to study are called the curl of a vector field and the divergence. So in this video, we're going to talk about the curl, and the next video will be about the divergence of a vector field. Now, I would really like to give credit to the following website called mathinsight.org. They have some really good explanations, uh, some very nice animations, and so I would really encourage you to go and visit that site if what I say is not very clear. So if we consider a vector field, say, representing a fluid, the curl of the vector field represents the microscopic rotation of the vector field. And sometimes it's called the swirliness of the vector field. Now, what do we mean by microscopic? Well, microscopic is different from macroscopic. So if I take a small sphere, like I have here, and I place it in the vector field, the macroscopic rotation is how that sphere is going to be moved around by the vector field. So in this particular vector field, it will move the sphere around in a circle. That's the macroscopic rotation, and that is not the curl. What the curl is, is if the microscopic rotation. So imagine that you fix just the center of the sphere, and the sphere is free to rotate in any direction about any axis. And so it's free to, to rotate due to the forces of the vector field. So in this vector field, if you look, the vectors on the outer part of the sphere have, are larger. They have more force. So there's more force pushing on the outer part than on the inner part. And that's going to induce a rotation in this diagram in a counterclockwise direction. So it's that's what we mean by microscopic rotation. So the curl then is going to be a vector. The curl of a vector field is another vector. Well, that means it has to have direction and magnitude. The direction is going to be along the axes of rotation. When that little sphere has some rotation microscopic rotation induced by the vector field, the axis about which it rotates is the direction of the curl. And how do we know uh, which direction to choose along the axis? Uh, we use the right hand rule. So we put our fingers, rotate our fingers, or wrap our fingers around the direction of rotation, and then the direction of our thumb, that is the positive curl. And the length of the uh, curl vector is determined by the speed of rotation. So the faster the rotation, the longer the curl vector. So let's go over the right-hand rule a little bit, and we're going to need that in order to understand how to find the components of this curl vector. So our original vector field has three 
component functions, P, Q, and R. So P is the function that moves in the I direction. Q is the function that is the multiplier times the J vector, and R is the function that is the multiplier times the K direction. So we know that finger cross hand yields thumb. When we we're studying vectors, that's what we used. Now we have a rotation. And so the idea is if you wrap your fingers in the direction of the rotation, your thumb is going to point in the vector. So you can think of it this way. If I do A cross B, I'm taking A and rotating it in the direction of B. And so if I curl my fingers that way, my thumb will point in the direction of A cross B. And so that would also indicate what it would be a positive rotation according to the right hand rule. So in order to find the components of the curl, we're going to look at the uh, three coordinate planes. And so we have our triad here. And if I wanted to look at uh, what would be the direction of rotation if I had uh, my curl in the positive k direction. Well, I put my thumb in the direction of k, wrap my uh, fingers around the z-axis, and so that rotation right there is the rotation that I would expect. So that would be i rotating onto j. So uh, the k vector is, should be i cross j. Now let's do this with, for another direction. If I look about, if I want the curl to be in the positive j direction, then I would point my thumb in the positive k direction wrap my fingers around the y-axis there. And so I'd have that type of rotation in the, um, what would that be, the xz plane. And I would say that in order to get j, I would take k and rotate it onto i, or take k cross i. All right, and then finally, uh, let's see here, we did the k direction, j direction. So this should be the i direction. So again, I put my thumb in the positive i direction. And so the rotation induced would be this rotation in the uh, y, z plane. And that would say j is getting rotated onto k. In other words, i would be j cross k. All right. So Let's start all right, with our rotations then. So we're going to be rotating. Uh, if I look at down the, the positive z-axis at the xy plane, that would be a counterclockwise uh, rotation. If I look down the j-axis in the... Uh, what would that be? The x, z plane. I'm going to have to think a little bit about this. This is going around this way. If I look down the positive j-axis, that would also be a counterclockwise rotation. Uh, we're going to talk more about that. And then here, if I look down the positive uh, uh, x-axis at the uh, y, z plane, again, I would have a counterclockwise uh, rotation being a positive rotation. So let's look at the xy plane. In other words, we're looking at the k component of curl. All right? And so in order to have, so my thumb now is pointing the positive k direction, and my fingers then would say wrap around this circle, or you could think of this as the top view of the sphere uh, in a counterclockwise rotation. So how could I 
induce a counterclockwise rotation. Well, remember my P uh, function is the component function for the I direction. So as Y increases from the bottom of the sphere to the top of the sphere, if I want the sphere to be rotating in a counterclockwise direction, I need to have the force on the bottom to be greater than the force on the top. I need to push the bottom more than I push the top. Even if I'm pushing in the same direction, as long as this bottom part is pushing more than the top, in the end, it's going to rotate in a counterclockwise direction. So that means that my change in P over my change in Y, so I'm always thinking of Y as increasing. So delta Y is positive, but that means that as Y increases, P decreases, so the ratio has to be negative to get this sphere to spin in a counterclockwise direction, which would correspond to positive curl. Now, the P force is not the only force that's acting in the XY plane. Now, remember that uh, we also have the R force, but the R force is not going to impact this at all because the R force is going to be pointing in the K direction. So it can't spin this or induce any spin in the XY plane. Only the P force, which is parallel to I, and this Q force, which is the coefficient on the J vector. Now, if I want to induce a spin on this sphere in the counterclockwise direction, then as X increases, I want Q to increase as well, because if the right force is larger than the left force, the net effect is that the sphere is going to turn in a counterclockwise direction. So in other words, as X increases, Q should increase as well. So the ratio is going to be positive and that will get us a spin in the counterclockwise direction, which is our positive curl. So the K component of curl would be, well, I'd like to have this ratio the change in Q over the change in X, plus the opposite of the change in P over the change in Y. Because remember, uh, we want this to be negative in order to get a positive curl. And so then in the limit, I would get the partial of Q with respect to X minus the partial of P with respect to Y. Now that looks familiar. We have definitely seen this expression before. We'll make that connection later. So that's our K component. We can do the same kind of logic to find the other components. So for the I component, it's very similar. So if I have the I vector pointing out of the screen here, then I'll be looking down the X axis at the YZ plane, a positive curl would mean my thumb is pointing out of the screen. So my fingers would wrap around the sphere in a counterclockwise direction. So it's the same kind of idea. Now uh, here I have what vectors point in the J direction. Those are my Q vectors. So as Z increases, I'd like to see Q decreasing. In other words, I want the bottom force to be pushing more than the top force in order to get that positive curl or counterclockwise spin. So in order to get that, then the change in Q over the change in Z, well, the Z we're always thinking is increasing. So Delta Z is positive. So I want Delta Q to be negative. And the same idea now with the vectors that are pointing in the K direction. Remember, I is pointing out of the screen here. So as Y increases, I would like 
R to increase as well. I want the force on the right to be larger than the force on the left. And so that will get me the right direction of spin to make positive curl. And so I want that ratio to be positive. So my I component for curl is going to be approximately, well, the change in R over the change in Y plus the opposite of the change of X over the change in Z, which again in the limit will give us a partial derivative, partial of R over partial Y or with respect to Y uh, minus the partial of Q with respect to Z. That difference in partials will be the I component of curl. Now for the J component, uh, we just, our uh, usual way of writing uh, our axes uh, is we'd like to have the axes pointing to the right to uh, indicate positive and pointing up to be positive. If I do that with the XZ plane, so look at the 3D view here. If I make X point to the right and Z point up, then uh, the positive y axis or the j vector is pointing into the board. So this is the opposite of uh, what we had with the other two coordinate planes. And so now I would need to uh, point my uh, thumb into the board. And then when I do that, so again, if you think about our right hand rule, I want my thumb to be pointing in the positive J direction and then my fingers will wrap around the Y axis or the sphere. Uh, well, if I were looking down the positive Y axis, but not, I'm not here, I'm looking down the negative Y axis. And so a uh, positive curl is actually clockwise in this view when I make the x-axis positive going to the right and the z-axis positive when going up. So it's a little bit different, but really uh, our analysis is going to be the same. We just have to remember that because of this convention, the way we write the xz plane, that uh, for this view, clockwise represents positive curl. All right, so in the XZ plane, we could have something, some vectors pointing in the I direction. So the I component of F, that means the P function. And so to get clockwise, I want the top force to be bigger than the bottom force. That will induce a clockwise spin, which remember the clockwise then means my thumb points into the board, which is the direction of J in this case. And so that would mean that as Z increases, I want P to increase as well. So I want the ratio of delta P over delta Z to be positive. The other component that could make this sphere spin in a clockwise direction is the k component, which is the r function. So now in order to get a clockwise spin, uh, the left force has to be bigger than the right force, which means that r is decreasing as x increases. And so the ratio of delta r over delta x is going to have to be negative. And so the to get positive curl or get the component of curl, I would take my ratio delta P over delta Z and then add the opposite of delta R over delta X because R is decreasing in order to get the spin in the positive direction. 
So again, in the limit, we get a difference of partials, the partial of P with respect to Z minus the partial of R with respect to X. So we found all the components um, based on these uh, analysis of the three coordinate planes. And so uh, remembering this, well, I, we can always go back to the picture here. I can say, well, in the I, to get the I component, I could have forces which are parallel to the Y axis that is in the J direction. So that'd be Q forces. And what would I want? I want the, uh, as Z increases, I would want the Q force to decrease. And so I'd have a minus Q, partial of Q with respect to Z. And then, um, the R force, which is going in the K direction, I'd want that to increase. So I should have partial of R with respect to Z minus partial of Q, uh, sorry, partial of R with respect to Y minus partial of Q with respect to Z. And I could think about those rotations for my other two coordinate planes and get the other two components uh, for the curl. Uh, and there are some other patterns here you could observe to help you remember it. But really remembering it this way, uh, while it's always good to be able to fall back and make sure it makes sense to you, um, it is uh, really very challenging. Uh, so we have a memory aid. And it's based on the same type of determinant structure that we used with the cross product. But in the middle row here, we actually have instead of uh, you know numbers or something else, we actually have partial derivative uh, operators. And so, what would this mean? Well, this would mean that in order to find the i component, I would take the partial of y. With, I mean, sorry, the partial of R with respect to Y, and then subtract off the partial of Q with respect to Z. And remember that for the J component in the cross product, we have a minus sign out here in front of the minor. And what would this minor mean? It would mean take the partial of R with respect to X, subtract off the partial of P with respect to Z. And then finally, to get the K component, I would take the partial of Q with respect to X, subtract off the partial of P with respect to Y. And so we actually uh, put those partials in this del vector. So it really is a differential operator, so to say. And so we could consider the curl as being del cross f. So that's a great memory aid, and it's going to help us understand some other properties of both the curl and the divergence as well. So let's look at an example. We're going to try to find the curl of this vector field. So we're going to use our memory aid. I'm going to put the component functions in order in the bottom row. The middle row is just the uh, partials. And then, of course, the top is i, j, k, just like with the cross product. And so what am I going to do? I'm going to take the partial of, with respect to y of y squared z, subtract off the partial with respect to z of x sine z. That's going to be my i component. Now subtracting, remember this subtraction, this is the most common mistake. So focus on this J component that you're going to have a minus sign here. And you're going to take the partial of X, partial with respect to X of Y squared Z, subtract off the partial with respect to Z of X squared Y. In this case, um, if I had forgot the minus sign, I'd still be okay because that's just going to be zero. And finally, to get the 
uh, oh yeah, we'll remember that minus sign though. Finally, to get the k component, I'll take the partial with respect to x of x sine z, subtract off the partial with respect to y of x squared y. So let me take those partials. And so I uh, get uh, 2yz, make sure that makes sense. Yes, it's partial with respect to y. Here, partial with respect to z uh, is uh, going to be just x cosine z. That's good. Uh, there's no uh, x in this first term, so its partial is going to be 0 with respect to x. And there's no z in the second term here, so the partial with respect to z is going to be zero. And then in the, the k component, partial of, with respect to x of uh, this function is just going to be sine z. Partial with respect to y will just be x squared. So I can clean that up a little bit there. Let's do another example. So here we're going to find, here's another way of writing curl. Remember del cross f really just means curl, but it really is suggestive of our uh, memory aid. So let's go ahead and put the component functions in the bottom row, the partials in the middle row, i, j, and k. And when you write these, remember to put your hats or arrows because they are vectors. So vectors have to have arrows just like here, or hats if they are unit vectors. So let's see here. Finding the i component, I'll take the partial with respect to y of that function, subtract off the partial of z of that function. So the partial respect to y, I don't have to worry about the first term here. So that'll give me 2xy. Got that right. Subtract off uh, 2xy. Okay. Got to remember the minus sign minus sign here, then put things in parentheses. I'll take the partial with respect to x of this function. So that would be what y squared plus 4xz. Uh, and then here I can see I have a typo, but you'll have to forgive me. I will try to make that correction right now. There we go. The partial with respect to z of this function is going to be y squared plus 4xz. So that's going to be add out. And then the k component, well, let me make my correction again. There we go. Well, the partial with respect to x of this function is just going to be 2yz. The partial with respect to y of this function is going to be 2yz, so they add out as well. And so all my components are 0. So the uh, curl of this vector field is the 0 vector. And so we have a special uh, name for vector fields whose curl is zero. We call them either curl-free or irrotational. So curl-free or irrotational vector fields are kind of interesting, and we want to talk about them a little bit more. But to understand them, we want to or understand these irrotational uh, vector fields, we need to understand the connection between curl and line integrals. And to understand that, we're going to have to talk about the mean value theorem for integrals, and in this case, specifically for double integrals. And it just says that if you have a continuous function, on a closed bounded region R, then there's a point in that region R where the function value is the same as the double integral of the function over R divided by the area of R. 
Now, this particular expression on the right hand side, you've seen it before. It was a while ago, but it was the average value of the function. So the mean value theorem for integrals simply says that the function achieves its average value over r at some point in r. And if you think about that, it should make sense. Now, if there's kind of an average value, then you kind of would expect that, oh, well, half of the function values, it's not exactly the way I'm saying it, but you know, half of the surface is going to be above it, and half of the surface is going to be below it. And so there's going to be some point on the surface which is going to be the represent the average value of that surface or the average value of that function. All right, so we'll use that. The other idea that we need to talk about is called circulation. Now, circulation has to do with line integrals of vector fields. And we derived the uh, notion of the line integral of a vector field from the physical application of work. But we could also look at this as a, if you think of the vector field as a fluid, the line integral really is the amount of the fluid or the vector field F flowing in the same direction along the curve C. And in fact, if you have a closed curve, then the line integral is the amount of the uh, vector field flowing around that curve C in the positive direction. And that's what we call the circulation of F around C. Okay. So if I take a small circle, so C is now just going to be a very simple curve, just a small circle. It's going to have a center at x comma y has a radius r. Then from Green's theorem, I can say, well, okay, the line integral around this small circle is going to be the same as the double integral over the interior of the circle, so the disk of the partial of q with respect to x minus the partial of p with respect to y. And aha, this is where we saw that expression before. It was in Green's theorem. So really, Green's theorem, the integrand on the double integral is simply the kth component of the curl of that vector field. So this is sometimes called the vector version of Green's theorem, where you write the double integral as the curl of f dotted with k. All right, well, here we have a double integral. And so the mean value theorem for integrals says that there's some point in that disk, remember r is a disk here, right? There's some point in that disk where the value of the function, well, the value of the function here is the curl of f dotted with k. So the curl of f evaluated at that particular point is going to be the same as the average value of the function. So the average value of curl of f dotted with k. And the average value, well, that's just going to be one over the area times this line integral. So we have this connection here between the kth component and this line integral about that circle. And so that's going to be true no matter how small the circle is. So let's say that's the same as saying we're going to let r go to zero. So the kth component is going to be the limit of that line integral. So the circulation divided by the area as the area goes to zero. Huh. Well, what does that mean? Well, that would say that uh, 
if I have a conservative vector field, I know that this line integral around any closed curve, so certainly around a small circle, that line integral is going to evaluate to zero. It doesn't matter what value of r I have, no matter how small r gets. So that means that in the limit, it's going to be zero as well. And honestly, there's nothing special about the kth component of curl. We can make similar arguments for the i and j components of curl. So that would tell me that if I have a conservative vector field, that uh, the curl of that conservative vector field must be zero. So in our terminology that we used before, conservative vector fields are curl free or conservative vector fields are irrotational. And so what does it mean for a vector field to be conservative? Well, that means that it must be the gradient of some scalar. So if I have a scalar function uh, f that has continuous second order partial derivatives, then the curl of the gradient of f is going to be the zero vector. So let me just check that using my memory aid. So this says that uh, I'm going to put the components of the gradient of f, so the partial of f with respect to x, the partial of f with respect to y, the partial of f with respect to z go in the bottom row, my partials go in the middle row, and of course i, j, and k with the hats go in the top row. And what do I get? Well, for the ith component, I would get the second partial derivative of f. It's a mixed partial, first z, then y. And then I would subtract off, again, the second partial derivative, but now first y, then z. Huh. Then for the j component, remember the negative sign. What will I have? A second mixed partial. It'll be z, then x, subtract off a second mixed partial, x then z. And finally, for the k component, I'll have, again, the difference of two mixed partials, y then x, and then x followed by y. Well, if I have continuous second order partial derivatives, then those differences are all zero. And that is because of Clairaut's theorem. So we gave a, uh, a reasoning for this result that conservative vector fields are curl free, motivating it by the connection with circulation. But uh, if we just work out the algebra, we find that because of Clairaut's theorem that we are going to get this result as well. So, we know that conservative vector fields are irrotational. And the question is, is the converse true? In other words, that if I have an irrotational field, that means a vector field whose curl is zero, can I conclude that it's a conservative vector field? And not always, but sometimes. What do I need? What conditions must be met in order for a, an irrotational or curl-free vector field to be conservative? Well, it has to be defined on all of R3. So its domain must be all of R3. If there's any part of the domain that's left out, it may or may not be conservative. It doesn't mean that for sure it's not going to be a conservative vector field, uh, but uh, you can't conclude that without doing more work, like maybe finding a, a potential function for it. Uh, but if I have a vector field which is defined on all of R3, 
The component functions have to have con continuous first order partial derivatives. And of course, it has to be curl free. Uh, then you can say that it is a conservative vector field. So we're going to stop our uh, discussion about curl right now. And uh, in the next video, we're going to learn about another way of measuring how a vector field can change called the divergence.